a century of poetry. Anthony Thwaite continues his exploration of the 19th century by looking at some of the poetry of the 1830s. The years that cut across the last program and this one, roughly between the death of Byron in 1824 and the emergence of Tennyson in the mid-1830s, are often called dead when they aren't being called transitional. But old voices still spoke up, and new ones could be heard in the wings. And reading through this 1830-1839 decade hasn't been a dull or unrewarding task. True, there's something elegiac about a good deal of the work, and I've let that emerge in this programme. To begin with, two old poets looking back at the past through the remembered dead. In 1835, James Hogg died, the Ettrick Shepherd as he was known, and indeed he was born in Ettrick Forest in Scotland and had worked as a shepherd. Hogg had been taken up by Walter Scott and had made the acquaintance, sometimes the friendship, of a lot of literary notables in the 1810s and 20s, including Wordsworth. Wordsworth and Hogg had been born in exactly the same year, 1770, and on Hogg's death Wordsworth wrote what he called an extempore effusion. In it, he commemorates not only Hogg, but Scott, Coleridge, Lamb, and Crabbe. He speaks as a frail survivor. Here is Wordsworth's extempore effusion upon the death of James Hogg. When first, descending from the moorlands, I saw the stream of Yarrow glide along a bare and open valley, the Ettrick Shepherd was my guide. When last along its banks I wandered, through groves that had begun to shed their golden leaves upon the pathways, my steps the border minstrel led. The mighty minstrel breathes no longer, mid mouldering ruins low he lies, and death upon the braes of Yarrow has closed the shepherd poet's eyes. Nor has the rolling year twice measured from sign to sign its steadfast course, since every mortal power of Coleridge was frozen at its marvellous source. The rapt one of the godlike forehead, the heaven-eyed creature, sleeps in earth, and lamb, the frolic and the gentle, has vanished from his lonely hearth. Like clouds that rake the mountain summits, or waves that owe no curbing hand, how fast has brother followed brother from sunshine to the sunless land. Yet I whose lids from infant slumber were earlier raised, remain to hear a timid voice that asks in whispers, who next will drop and disappear? Our haughty life is crowned with darkness, like London with its own black wreath, on which with thee, O crab, forth looking, I gazed from Hampstead's breezy heath. As if but yesterday departed, thou too art gone before, but why, o'er ripe fruit, seasonably gathered, should frail survivors heave a sigh? Mourn, rather, for that Holy Spirit, sweet as the spring as ocean deep, for her who, ere her summer faded, has sunk into a breathless sleep. No more of old romantic sorrows for slaughtered youth or love-lorn maid. With sharper grief is Yarrow smitten, and Ettrick mourns with her, their poet dead. An even older poet, Samuel Rogers, he was in his early 90s when he died in 1855, having outlived even Wordsworth, looked back in his old age to one poet in particular, Byron, whom Rogers had met both in London and in Italy. Here's Rogers, in an extract from his long poem, Italy, recollecting a meeting with Byron, in Bologna. Much had passed since last we parted, and those five short years, much had they told. His clustering locks were turned grey, nor did aught recall the youth that swam from Sestos to Abydos. Yet his voice, still it was sweet, still from his eye the thought flashed lightning-like, nor lingered on the way, waiting for words. Far, far into the night we sat conversing, no unwelcome hour, the hour we met. And when Aurora rose, 
Rising, we climbed the rugged Apennine. Well I remember how the golden sun filled with its beams the unfathomable gulfs as on we travelled. And along the ridge, mid groves of cork and cistus and wild fig, his motley household came. Not last nor least, Batista, who upon the moonlight sea of Venice had so ably, zealously served, and at parting thrown his oar away to follow through the world, who without stain had worn so long that honourable badge, the gondoliers, in a patrician house arguing unlimited trust. Not last nor least thou, though declining in thy beauty and strength, faithful Moretto, to the latest hour guarding his chamber door, and now along the silent, sullen strand of Missolonghi, howling in grief. He had just left that place of old renown, once in the Adrian Sea, Ravenna, where from Dante's sacred tomb he had so oft, as many a verse declares, drawn inspiration, where at twilight time, through the pine forest, wandering with loose rain, wandering and lost, he had so oft beheld, what is not visible to a poet's eye, the spectre knight, the hellhounds and their prey, the chase, the slaughter, and the festal mirth suddenly blasted. It was a theme he loved, but others claimed their turn, and many a tower shattered, uprooted from its native rock, its strength, the pride of some heroic age, appeared and vanished. Many a sturdy steer, yoked and unyoked, while, as in happier days, he poured his spirit forth. The past forgot, all was enjoyment, not a cloud obscured present or future. He is now at rest, and praise and blame fall on his ear alike, now dull in death. Yes, Byron, thou art gone, gone like a star that through the firmament shot and was lost, in its eccentric course dazzling, perplexing. Yet thy heart, methinks, was generous, noble, noble in its scorn of all things low or little, nothing there sordid or servile. If imagined wrongs pursued thee, urging thee sometimes to do things long regretted, oft, as many know, none more than I, thy gratitude would build on slight foundations. And if in thy life not happy, in thy death thou surely wert, thy wish accomplished, dying in the land where thy young mind had caught ethereal fire, dying in Greece, and in a cause so glorious. They in thy train, ah, little did they think, as round we went, that they so soon should sit mourning beside thee, while a nation mourned, changing her festival for her funeral song. That they so soon should hear the minute gun, as morning gleamed on what remained of thee, roll o'er the sea, the mountains, numbering thy years of joy and sorrow. Thou art gone. And he who would assail thee in thy grave, oh, let him pause. For who among us all, tried as thou wert, even from thine earliest years, when wandering, yet unspoiled, a highland boy, tried as thou wert, and with thy soul of flame, pleasure, while yet the down was on thy cheek, uplifting, pressing, and to lips like thine, her charmed cup. Ah, who among us all could say he had not heard as much, and more? John Clare, though he lived on, still intermittently writing till his death in 1864, published only one more book in his lifetime, The Rural Muse, in 1835. From it, I've taken this brief descriptive piece, as unerringly as ever with its eye on the object and its words precisely poised. I love to see the old heath's withered brake mingle its crimpled leaves with furs and ling. 
while the old heron from the lonely lake starts slow and flaps his melancholy wing. An oddling crow in idle motion swing on the half-rotten ash tree's topmost twig, beside whose trunk the gypsy makes his bed. Up flies the bouncing woodcock from the brig, where a black quagmire quakes beneath the tread. The field fares chatter in the whistling thorn, and for the haw round fields and closen rove, and coy bum barrels, twenty in a drove, flit down the hedgerows in the frozen plain, and hang on little twigs, and start again. Three poets who are often grouped together as marking some sort of transition from high romantic to Victorian are Thomas Hood, Thomas Lovell Beddoes, and George Darley. What may unite them, putting on one side Hood's comical or facetious verses, is something both macabre and fanciful. I've chosen just one poem to represent them, a lyric from Darley's Nepenthe, a frail, decorative moment. O oh, blessed, unfabled incense tree that burns in glorious Araby, with red scent chalicing the air till earth life grow Elysian there, half buried to her flaming breast in this bright tree she makes her nest hundred sunned phoenix when she must crumble at length to hoary dust. Her gorgeous deathbed her rich pyre burnt up with aromatic fire, her urn sight high from spoiler men, her birthplace when self-born again. The mountainless green wilds among, here ends she her unechoing song, with amber tears and odorous sighs, mourned by the desert where she dies. There's a curious parallel to that sort of thing that was going on miles away across the Atlantic. Edgar Allan Poe published his first volume of poems while he was still in his teens. His first well-known poem was probably written a few years after that, though Poe used to maintain that he wrote it when he was only fifteen, to the first purely ideal love of my soul, or, more mundanely, Mrs. Jane Craig Stannard. He renamed her Helen, and here is the poem, to Helen, first published in 1831. Helen, thy beauty is to me like those Nicene barks of yore that gently o'er a perfumed sea the weary way-worn wanderer bore to his own native shore. On desperate seas long wont to roam, thy hyacinth hair, thy classic face, thy naiad airs have brought me home to the glory that was Greece, and the grandeur that was Rome. Lo, in yon brilliant window niche, how statue-like I see thee stand, the agate lamp within thy hand. Ah, Psyche, from the regions which are holy land. In England, two poets whose work was just beginning to be known were Browning and Tennyson. Browning published Pauline, a fragment of a confession, in 1833 when he was only 20, and two years later Paracelsus, one of those impossible, unactable verse dramas which the Romantics doggedly went in for. Think of almost any of them, Wordsworth, Shelley, Keats, Barr and Blake, and they all attempted verse drama. There was Browning's Strafford too, which was actually performed. But Browning's real gifts lay elsewhere, in the area of drama, though not in drama itself. Dramatic romances, Browning came to call them, dramatic lyrics, and dramatis personae. One of the earliest of these is Porphyria's Lover. A few moments ago, I used the word macabre of Beddoes and Darley. I might have saved it for this poem. The rain set early in tonight, a sullen wind was soon awake. It tore the elm tops down for spite and did its worst to vex the lake. I listened with heart fit to break. When glided in Porphyria, straight she shut the cold out and the storm and kneeled and made the cheerless grate blaze up and all the cottage warm. Which done, 
She rose, and from her form withdrew the dripping cloak and shawl, and laid her soiled gloves by, untied her hat, and let the damp hair fall. And last, she sat down by my side and called me. When no voice replied, she put my arm about her waist, and made her smooth white shoulder bare, and all her yellow hair displaced, and stooping, made my cheek lie there, and spread o'er all her yellow hair, murmuring how she loved me, she too weak for all her heart's endeavor to set its struggling passion free from pride and vain ties dissever, and give herself to me forever. But passion sometimes would prevail, nor could tonight's gay feast restrain a sudden thought of one so pale for love of her, and all in vain. So, she was come through wind and rain. Be sure, I looked up at her eyes, happy and proud. At last I knew Porphyria worshipped me. Surprise made my heart swell, and still it grew while I debated what to do. That moment she was mine, mine, fair, perfectly pure and good. I found a thing to do, and all her hair in one long yellow string I wound three times her little throat around and strangled her. No pain, felt she. I am quite sure she felt no pain. As a shut bud that holds a bee, I warily oped her lids, Again laughed the blue eyes without a stain, and I untightened next the tress about her neck. Her cheek once more blushed bright beneath my burning kiss. I propped her head up as before, only this time my shoulder bore her head, which droops upon it still. The smiling, rosy little head, so glad it has its utmost will, that all its scorn that once is fled, and I its love, am gained instead. Porphyria's love. She guessed not how her darling one wish would be heard. And thus we sit together now, and all night long we have not stirred. And yet God has not said a word. That first appeared in a magazine in 1836 when Browning was 23 and some years before most of the other poems associated with it. Tennyson was an early beginner, too. He published work in Poems by Two Brothers, three of them contributed, actually, Charles, Frederick and Alfred, when he was only 18. Three years later, in 1830, he published Poems Chiefly Lyrical. In it, there appears Mariana, one of his most successful poems, strange, intricately patterned, mesmerised and mesmerising. The starting point for Tennyson seems to have been a line from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure, with which he prefaces the poem, Mariana in the Moated Grange. There's no clear reference to the play in the poem itself. It simply exists in its own mysterious Gothic world. With the blackest moss the flower plots were thickly crusted one and all. The rusted nails fell from the knots that held the pair to the gable wall. The broken sheds looked sad and strange. Unlifted was the clinking latch. Weeded and worn the ancient thatch upon the lonely moated grange. She only said, My life is dreary. He cometh not, she said. She said, I am a weary, a weary. I would that I were dead. Her tears fell with the dews at even. Her tears fell ere the dews were dried. She could not look on the sweet heaven, either at morn or eventide. After the flitting of the bats, when thickest dark did trance the sky, she drew her casement curtain by and glanced athwart the blooming flats. She only said, The night is dreary. He cometh not, she said. She said, I am a weary, a weary, I would that I were dead. Upon the middle of the night, waking, she heard the night fowl crow. The cock sang out an hour ere light. From the dark fen the oxen's low came to her. 
Without hope of change, in sleep she seemed to walk forlorn, till cold winds woke the grey-eyed morn about the lonely moated grange. She only said, The day is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I am a-weary, a-weary, I would that I were dead. About a stone cast from the wall, a sluice with blackened waters slept, and o'er it many, round and small, the clustered marish mosses crept. Hard by, a poplar shook all way, all silver green with gnarled bark, for leagues no other tree did mark the level waste, the rounding grey. She only said, My life is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I am a-weary, a-weary, I would that I were dead. All day within the dreamy house, the doors upon their hinges creaked, the blue flies sung in the pane, the mouse behind the mouldering wainscot shrieked, or from the crevice peered about. Old faces glimmered through the doors, old footsteps trod the upper floors, old voices called her from without. She only said, My life is dreary, he cometh not, she said. She said, I am a-weary, a-weary, I would that I were dead. The sparrows chirrup on the roof, the slow clock ticking, and the sound which to the wooing wind aloof the poplar made did all confound her sense. But most she loathed the hour when the thick moated sunbeam lay athwart the chambers and the day was sloping toward his western bar. Then said she, I am very dreary. He will not come, she said. She wept. I am a weary, a weary. Oh God, that I were dead. Tennyson and Browning were to be the future, and quite quickly. But thinking back to Wordsworth's and Rogers's elegiac poems at the beginning of the programme, there were still survivors. Coleridge died in 1834, and in the year of his death, his three-volume poetical works were published. They include this late piece, looking wistfully and ruefully back on a career he saw as blighted and unfulfilled. Verse a breeze mid blossoms straying, where hope clung feeding like a bee, both were mine. Life went a maying with nature, hope, and poesy when I was young. When I was young, ah, woeful when, ah, for the change twixt now and then. This breathing house not built with hands, this body that does me grievous wrong, or airy cliffs and glittering sands, how lightly then it flashed along. Like those trim skiffs, unknown of yore, on winding lakes and rivers wide, that ask no aid of sail or oar, that fear no spite of wind or tide. Nought cared this body for wind or weather, when youth and I lived in together. Flowers are lovely, love is flower-like. Friendship is a sheltering tree. Oh, the joys that came down shower-like of friendship, love, and liberty, ere I was old. Ere I was old. Ah, woeful air, which tells me youth's no longer here. Oh, youth, for years so many and sweet, tis known that thou and I were one. I'll think it but a fond conceit. It cannot be that thou art gone. Thy vesper bell hath not yet tolled, and thou wert a a masker bold. What strange disguise hast now put on to make believe that thou art gone? I see these locks in silvery slips, this drooping gait, this altered size. But springtide blossoms on thy lips, and tears take sunshine from thine eyes. Life is but thought, so think I will that youth and I are housemates still. Dewdrops are the gems of morning, but tears of mournful eve. Where no hope is, life's a warning 
that only serves to make us grieve when we are old. That only serves to make us grieve with oft and tedious taking leave. Like some poor nigh-related guest that may not rudely be dismissed, yet hath outstayed his welcome while, and tells the jest without the smile.